Feminists get a lot wrong about sex work and I'm absolutely including myself in that. I've been making videos about sex on the internet for over a decade and my views and understanding of sex work have changed massively in that time. One of the books that helped me in understanding sex work better was Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Workers' Rights by Molly Smith and Juno Mack. Reading it really highlighted for me the many traps that feminists fall into when thinking about or talking about sex work. And one quote that really stood out to me was, stuck in the domain of sex and whether it is good or bad for women, an adamant that it could only be one or the other, it was all too easy for feminists to think of the prostitute only in terms of what she represented to them. They claimed ownership of sex worker experiences in order to make sense of their own. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to make a video about how feminists often focus on what sex work means for us instead of focusing on the actual experiences of sex workers and why we shouldn't do that and other things that feminists get wrong about sex work. Before we dive in, some quick definitions. I was using feminist and sex worker there as if they were two separate groups, but of course there are feminist sex workers. And in fact, in Revolting Prostitutes, they say that sex workers were the original feminists. Also in this video, I'm going to be talking about two archetypes of feminists, the pro-sex feminists and the anti-prostitution feminists. And I just wanna give a massive thank you and shout out to Decrim Now, who are an organization and campaign in the UK fighting for the decriminalization of sex work who helped out with the fact checking and tone checking of this video. It was important to me to make sure that I wasn't speaking for sex workers, especially as that's not an experience that I have, which leads us to the first thing that feminists often get wrong about sex work, which is making the conversation all about ourselves, centering ourselves in the conversation. Feminists who aren't sex workers have the privilege of the ethics of sex work being a hypothetical for us. We're removed from the actual reality of what sex work is like, so we get to theorize and debate about it. Our focus is often on the impact it has on our rights and lives. What does the existence of sex work mean for my sexuality and my womanhood? Rather than the much more pressing material impact of the current working conditions for sex workers. It can become very easy in the debate to completely decenter the experiences of sex workers themselves. A slight tangent, but this is actually a pattern that we see happening a lot, especially at the moment with the quote unquote trans debate. The focus of mainstream discussion and media attention is all about what the existence of trans people means for cis people's, especially cis women's identity. How can cis women make sense of themselves and the world and the patriarchy when you've got these pesky trans people mucking it up? Spoiler alert, these are not the conversations that trans people are having. Their concerns are much more material, access to healthcare and housing not being discriminated against at work, being able to self-ID without doctor's approvals, and being able to exist safely in public spaces. And the media conversations often don't highlight or platform the voices of actual trans people, and sex workers are treated the same way. It is anti-prostitution feminists who have concerns about sex work, or pro-sex feminists who haven't done sex work themselves, who are allowed to have a voice. And all of this intellectualizing keeps the focus of the debate on who is right, rather than taking action that would actually help sex workers. We get fixated on whether sex work should exist at all, when in reality it does and sex workers need rights and support. Politically, the idea of sex workers' rights is still considered controversial and divisive. Not that wanting everyone to have basic rights, safety and dignity is controversial. Gestures at the general trash fire that is the UK and the world in 2023. By centering ourselves in the conversation, feminists can often fall into the trap of viewing sex workers as stereotypes, rather than as people with their own agency. Sex worker stereotypes. Revolting Prostitute speaks of the two boxes that feminists often try and put sex workers in. The anti-prostitution feminists focus on the exited woman who experienced harm in the sex industry and supports the criminalization of sex work. And the pro-sex feminists like to focus on the happy hooker who enjoys sex work and feels empowered by her job and supports the decriminalization of sex work. These are overly simple stereotypes, which isn't to say that they aren't true for some people doing sex work, but it ignores the more messy nuances. The happy hooker narrative is also one that the media has leaned into recently because it allows them to play with the titillation and taboo of sex without exploring the reality of what sex work can look like. Think shows like Secret Diary of a Call Girl or Netflix's Bonding. The problem is these stereotypes leave no room for the unhappy sex worker who both anti-prostitution and pro-sex feminists would rather ignore because she reminds us that some sex workers are forced to continue choosing survival over a noble exit. Nor does it leave room for the neutral sex worker 
who is largely ambivalent to the work but still wants to see their working conditions change. Their work is a necessity. People need money and resources to survive and you can sell sex for money and resources. Or if it is a choice, it's one driven by the lack of better options for safe, accessible and well-paid work elsewhere and no one else to fall back on. Sex work can be the best choice out of a load of really shit options. Want to make sure that no one has to do sex work as a last resort because they have no better options? Give people the resources that they need to live! The resources conversation rarely gets the limelight it deserves because it would require huge social change, including how do we make traditional work more accessible for people with disabilities, and how come we can't have free childcare? These conversations also ruin the fantasy. In Revolting Prostitutes, Mac and Smith say, raising the subject of the workers' needs for safety, money, or negotiating power would spoil the illusion that the worker and client are erotically in tune, and that she's just as sexually invested in their encounter as he is. The sex work is empowering narrative can be equally harmful, because you don't have to experience pleasure or love your job every day for it to be a valid line of work that deserves to be treated as such with rights and safety in place. It is the lack of legal protections for sex workers that makes sex work so unsafe. And why is there a lack of legal protections? Well, that comes down to millennia-old misogyny and whorephobia. Any job has the potential to be exploitative when you don't have any other options. Sex work isn't inherently more exploitative just because it involves sex. And this is why sex workers have a union, the Sex Workers Union, but not every sex worker can unionize because their work or workplace are still criminalized. Another big theme in sex work debates is the difference between sex work and trafficking. Sex work does not equal trafficking. In the past, I've talked about and reassured people that sex work is completely different to trafficking and should be treated and thought of as such. It was really interesting to have that view challenged in this book. Mac and Smith spend a lot of time talking about borders and migration and trafficking. This is obviously a huge topic, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to focus on what feminists often get wrong, which is to say that of course trafficking is bad, but sex work isn't trafficking so it isn't bad. Mac and Smith explain that it is understandable how we end up with this argument for the criminalization of sex work under the assumption that it tackles trafficking. However, under this framework, arrests of sex workers, colleagues, partners, landlords are justified on the basis that they are perpetrators. At the same time, arrests of sex workers themselves can then be seen as rescuing them without actually giving them any of the resources that they need to leave the sex industry if that's what they want. These arrests put sex workers in a huge amount of danger. So to show that they are not legitimate, we say sex work isn't trafficking. But saying that ignores sex workers who are working in exploitative or abusive conditions due to migration. In our imaginations, sex trafficking is some thin white woman being kidnapped and sold into the sex industry, which is very Hollywood. A more common experience is someone wanting to migrate, but needing help to do so because of restrictive immigration policies, and then owing a debt to the person who did, and often selling sex to pay off that debt and being trapped in that situation. Of course, that is an awful situation to be in, but harsher restrictions around sex work and trafficking, that's not necessarily going to to fix that. How about an easier and more humane immigration process in the first place? Saying sex work and trafficking are separate issues ignores the vital context of the reasons why people might migrate, and the ways immigration enforcement impacts the labour rights and safety of migrants. As Mac and Smith say, to assert simply that sex work and trafficking are completely different is to defend only documented sex workers who are not experiencing exploitation, but say nothing about those exploited at the intersection of migration and the sex industry. The reality is that laws around immigration and policies to tackle trafficking can have a massive impact on sex workers, documented or undocumented. So we need to talk about those things when we're talking about sex workers' rights. The laws that apply to sex workers also apply to victims of trafficking. For instance, victims of trafficking found in a brothel raid are often just deported straight back to the countries that they were trying to escape from. And both migrant sex workers and victims of trafficking are far more cautious of the police, meaning they have fewer avenues to turn to if they need help. And speaking of the police, policing doesn't tackle the patriarchy. The policies that regulate sex work are rarely created by sex workers themselves, and often supposedly well-intentioned laws end up punishing sex workers instead of helping them. The criminalization or even partial legalization of sex work puts sex workers in a position where it would be illegal for them to do anything that would make their work safer. As the English 
Collective of Prostitutes puts it, it's legal to be a sex worker in the UK, but working together and virtually anything you need to do to contact a client is illegal. There are three broad systems under which sex work is governed around the world. Criminalization prohibits the buying and selling of sex, and places criminal penalties on individuals who do so. There's also the Nordic model, which criminalizes the buying of sexual services, but not the selling of sexual services. And while this may sound helpful, you can't criminalize one half of the equation without criminalizing the other. In Nordic model countries, sex workers have to work in increasingly unsafe ways in order for their clients to avoid the police. And sex workers themselves are more often than not victims of these laws. Under legalization, the government regulates the sex trade by setting specific conditions under which the exchange of sexual services can take place, and the conditions in which it can't. It creates a two-tier system where some sex workers can operate legally, but many sex workers, specifically migrant and trans sex workers, still have to operate illegally because they can't comply with the strict laws. And decriminalization is the complete removal of criminal penalties in relation to the sex trade. Sex workers advocate for full decriminalization as it gives sex workers more power as workers to access rights and safety. While decriminalization doesn't end exploitation fully, it puts sex work in the same position as other labor movements and moves it out of the criminal sphere. So now that we know all of that, when it comes to talking about sex work, a key area where feminists, especially white cis feminists, trip up is when it comes to discussions of state violence. To a cis white feminist like myself, the idea of a sex worker being a victim of male violence is hashtag relatable, but being a victim of state violence is not. There is this narrative even within feminism that if somebody is in prison or has broken the law, then they deserve to be punished. Feminism that welcomes police power is called carceral feminism, which prioritizes policing and criminalization as the route for justice and equality for women. Black feminists such as Angela Davis have criticized the reliance of white feminism on the police because the criminal justice system perpetuates violence against women. Many sex workers say, no bad whores, only bad laws, to recognize how broken the system is and how it polices marginalized communities, actively making issues worse. Mack and Smith are very clear that attempting to eradicate commercial sex through policing does not tackle patriarchy. Instead, it continues to produce harassment, arrest, prosecution, eviction, violence, and poverty for those who sell sex. The privilege of being able to assume that state enforcement will protect your rights rather than uphold the systems of oppression you're facing is one that many anti-prostitution and pro-sex feminists share. I think we've begun to see more conversations about this, especially in the UK since the murder of Sarah Everard and the arrests at the vigil for her, but we still have a long way to go. It's important for feminists to understand that the systems that would make sex workers' material conditions better would also make our lives better. Not that we need to personally benefit to care about sex workers' rights, but it is time to talk about capitalism. Capitalism is fucking all of us, and not in a fun way. Rather than judging people for their choices, we should be working to ensure people have better choices that allow them safety and security. For some folks like disabled people or trans people, sex work can be less dehumanizing than the punitive government systems that are the proper routes for them to go through in order to access money and stability. Decriminalizing sex work would allow sex workers to organize, to work together, and to advocate for safer working conditions. We don't need more police powers to fix issues of sex work. What sex workers need is decriminalization and specialized and well-funded social services, welfare, benefits, housing, healthcare, mental health services, childcare, and drug and alcohol dependency support. And guess what? Those services would benefit pretty much everyone. Another thing that I keep thinking about that would be a great solution, although I don't know the logistics of it, would be universal basic income. It would stop people needing to take exploitative work in order to meet their basic needs, putting more power in the hands of workers rather than clients or bosses. This applies to sex workers, but this also applies to people like stay at home or single parents who stop working to look after children, or people who can't work full time because of disability or illness. Again, feminists end up getting stuck on the sex part of sex work when it's the work part we need to focus on. As Mac and Smith say, it is easy to imagine a world wherein no man is able to pay for sex simply because everyone who might have needed to sell it already has the resources that they need. We can work towards a more feminist world by making women 
women less poor, but not through bolstering the patriarchal power of the carceral state. Bam, this book is so good. Thank you so much for watching. There are loads of resources linked in the description, including this book, English Collective of Prostitutes, Decrim Now, Sex Workers Union, and Hookers Against Hardship, which is a mutual fund supporting sex workers during this cost of living crisis. Also, Decrim Now are currently running a campaign against the Nordic model, which members of the Labour Party are currently pushing for alongside members of the SNP in Scotland. This is running from the 20th of November to around mid-December, so definitely check out Decrim Now's social media for more information on how to get involved. Also, if you want to learn more in the latest season of my podcast, Doing It, in the Money episode, we interview sex worker and activist Lydia Caradonna, and I would highly recommend going to listen to that and everything that she has to say. She is amazing. Of course, if you have any other resources or books about sex work that you would like to share, especially if you're not from the UK, then please feel free to leave them in the comments. And thank you again to Decrim Now for helping with this video and for my patrons for supporting the work on this channel. Thanks again for watching. I will see you in the next video, which is actually going to be a very exciting and nerve wracking announcement. Patrons will already know. I'll see you then next week. Bye.